So welcome to the second day of this symposium. Um, and our first speaker today uh, is Jonathan Pritchard from Stanford University. Okay. Uh, great. Well, thank you, Molly, uh, for organizing this wonderful workshop. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about work that we've been doing on trying to understand the architecture of complex traits. And this is joint work with a number of people. Um, uh, so Evan Boyle uh, is a graduate student in my lab. Nasser Sinot Armstrong is a graduate student in my lab. Young Lee was previously a postdoc in my lab now at the University of Chicago. And Chuan Yao Liu is our collaborator at the University of Chicago. Um, so most of our intuition in genetics has come from um, thinking about sim simple and single gene traits. So much of the progress in the 20th century in genetics came from identifying mutations that, that cause a, an organismal trait and then doing molecular biology work to understand the links from, from, genetic from, from the genetic variant um, to, to how those changed uh, a phenotype. But most phenotypic variation, of course, is genetically complex. Um, so if you think of, of height, um, as I'll show you, there's an enormous number of variants across the genome that affect human height. And so the, I think this raises an important question. Um, what's the molecular mapping from genetic variation to complex traits? If you have many thousands of variants across the genome that affect a trait, what, what is the way that, like, how do those um, genetic variants get um, interpreted by a cell to produce a complex phenotype? So in this talk today, I'm going to start by um, showing you in the first half several examples of the, the incredible polygenicity of, of traits, even traits we might think of as being um, relatively uh, more simple than something like height turn out to being um, extremely polygenic. And then secondly, I'll tell you about our modeling that we've been doing to, to think about um, uh, at least one possible explanation for, uh, for how genetic variation links to complex phenotypes. So to begin with, I'll just uh, start with schizophrenia. So um, schizophrenia is a, um, uh, you know, a disease that uh, uh, we, we really don't understand very well at the molecular level. There's been an enormous amount of work um, from, from many people around the world to, uh, um, to perform mapping for uh, variants that affect schizophrenia risk. And in the, the latest meta-analysis for schizophrenia, um, using about uh, 250,000 individuals, they, they identified 108 genome-wide significant loci. So this is an extraordinary accomplishment. Um, a small number of these loci have been characterized molecularly. Or maybe maybe yeah, one of them has been characterized really well, and maybe uh, small numbers of others have been characterized to some extent. Um, however, even though that's an in, that may seem like an enormous number, together these hits only explain a small fraction of the expected heritability for schizophrenia. It's about 10%. Um, however, if you think, um, however, there are estimates of um, how much of the heritability is accounted for by all SNPs together, and this adds up to about 80%. So there's an enormous number of, um, of additional variants that are lurking down here in the bottom of this Manhattan plot that are not genome-wide significant. Um, these have tiny effects, but because there are so many of them, they add together to explain most of what's going on in the genetics of, of schizophrenia. And so another way of looking at this is um, in terms of estimates of how much um, each, each chromosome contributes to heritability. And this is a plot from um, Bogdan Pasaniok's lab. Um, the the x-axis here shows um, chromosome size in terms of thousands of SNPs. The y-axis shows an estimate of how much each chromosome is, is, is contributing to heritability. And you can see there's a very strong correlation between chromosome size and how much that each chromosome is contributing. And this is what you would expect in a model where there's an enormous number of variants um, and, uh, and there, there aren't variants that individually are, are, are contributing huge amounts. Um, there's a small outlier chromosome here, which is chromosome 6. Um, the single biggest hit for schizophrenia is in the MHC region, so you can see that pops off the line a little bit because of that, um, that one region. If we contrast this to another trait, this is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, for rheumatoid arthritis, um, the MHC region is contributing about 20% of the heritability. Um, but that's, again, on a polygenic background. So, so if you ignore chromosome 6, um, there's a, a clear relationship between chromosome size and how much, of each other, how much each of these other chromosomes is contributing. So in work that we've done, um, we've estimated for both schizophrenia and height that um, perhaps as many as 50% of haplotype blocks across the genome affect the trait. And 
Um, and this immediately suggests that they must be on the order of around 10 to the 5 causal variants across the genome affecting each of these traits. So you may be saying to yourself, well, you know, height is just an extraordinarily complicated trait. I mean, you could come up with a story for how, you know, you know essentially any organ system in the body might affect height in some way. Um, schizophrenia, perhaps, is you know, it's something we really don't understand the um, etiology of. I mean, you know, that's also potentially a, a really complicated trait. Um, what about something simpler? So we've started looking at the um, uh, at various biomarkers that have been measured in the, uh, um, in the UK Biobank data. And so I'm going to show you two examples of, of this and show you that they're also extremely polygenic. So the first of these is circulating urate levels in, in the blood. And so, so this is a, a small molecule. Um, the, the concentrations of urate are tightly regulated um, in the blood. If you have excess urate, this, has, um, this uh, leads causally to, to gout. Um, uh, and I didn't know much about gout before I started doing this, but basically urate crystallizes out to form these, these needles, um, which are very unpleasant. Um, OK, so the UK Biobank has measured urate levels um, in about 30 other metabolites in 430,000 individuals. And so we, we can do very well-powered GWAS to, to study the genetics of, of this trait. And we also started focusing on, on urate levels because there's a, there's a lot that's known about the um, a priori about the controls of urate levels in sharp contrast to something like schizophrenia, where a priori we know very little about what's driving that. So first of all, uh, we know a lot about the synthesis of urate. So it's um, synthesized in this uh, purine metabolic pathway. So, um, so here's, here's uh, uric acid down here. And, and we know that the genes that drive these um, uh, molecular <laughs> steps. Um, secondly, the regulation of urate levels is controlled by a, a whole set of um, known transport genes in the kidneys. So, so there are transporters that are moving urate in and out of the blood and in and out, in and out of the urine to, um, to, to control the levels tightly. Um, and a uh, spoiler alert here, the, uh, the top two hits in the genome um, uh, are two of the major transporters um, on this plot. Okay, so we can take urate levels, um, we can do um, a GWAS for this, and um, so uh, let's do some audience participation. How many uh, genome-wide significant loci do you think we're going to get for um, a simple trait like urate? You're very shy. <laughs> Come on, throw out some numbers. Okay, all right. OK, so here's the, uh, uh, the Manhattan plot for, for urate on a um, double log scale. And there are 262 genome-wide significant loci. Um, and I, I've compressed the, so compressed the, uh, the y-axis here. So there are two loci that are significant outliers on this. And those are the two transporter genes I indicated before. Um, but setting aside those two, it's clear that urate is, is nonetheless a very highly polygenic trait. So we can make the uh, we can do, make the same kind of plot that I showed you before for, for schizophrenia and uh, and for rheumatoid arthritis, looking at urate heritability by chromosome. And once again, the um, you can you can predict how much of the heritability comes from each chromosome really quite accurately, simply from chromosome size. Um, there's there's one outlier chromosome, which is chromosome four, um, and that's because because uh, it turns out, uh, by chance, both of the, well, this, both of the um, major transporter genes are, in, uh, are on chromosome 4 um, in different parts of the chromosome. Um, now, uh, so, so the, the biggest hit, this SLC2A9 gene, contributes about 13% of the heritability. Um, there's an additional 8% of the heritability that comes from uh, the second hit, as well as some other key transporters that show smaller hits. Um, but overall, nearly 80% of the estimated SNP heritability is coming in from this, this polygenic background. And some of the other hits we can, we can interpret. So for example, there are some transcription factors that, that are contributing small amounts. But, but in, aggr in aggregate, uh, the vast majority of the heritability for urate levels is coming from an enormous number of small signals across the genome. The other point that I want to make is that, um, like uh, other complex traits, most of the heritability is driven by regulatory variants. In the case of urate, it's coming uh, mainly from kidney. 
So this is a plot of the, uh, um, the, SNP, the enrichment of SNP heritability um, uh, for, for SNPs in active chromatin compared to genome-wide background. You can see that uh, uh, a kidney shows um, about a 30-fold enrichment. Um, and these, these other tissues actually show enrichment only be mainly because of um, active chromatin that's shared between kidney and those other tissues. So if we condition on kidney, um, these other signals from the other chromosomes essentially go away. Um, I just want to show you one more example um, quite quickly. So IGF-1, uh, insulin-like growth factor 1, is, a, is another important uh, metabolite um, that's, uh, or, sorry, it's a, it's a uh, protein that's, that's circulating in the, in the bloodstream. It's controlled by, um, by known uh, pathway, uh, so in particular RAS signaling pathway, um, controls IGF-1 levels. So um, this, this pointer doesn't work really, but... Uh, there we go. Um, so, so IGF-1 gets uh, uh, exported out of the bloodstream by, um, uh, and well, IGF-1 is involved in this, this RAS signaling pathway in which it's, it's passing signals into, into cells through this um, signaling process. And <clears throat> when we look at the, the GWAS for IGF-1, we find, in fact, that um, essentially all of the key genes uh, in the signaling pathway um, that are really proximal to the uh, IGF signaling at the uh, cell membrane um, get lit up by the GWAS. However, um, again, they only contribute a tiny fraction of the heritability. So these main IGF-1 pathways are estimating contributing about 2% of the SNP heritability. So to recap, um, what I've... Um, what I've shown you, and, and in additional work that we and many others in the field have done, uh, we find that heritability is spread very, very widely across the genome, as well as thinly, so they tend not to be, um, for, for most traits, there aren't enormous effects that drive the bulk of the heritability. Um, secondly, uh, genes with trait-relevant functions only contribute a really small fraction of the total um, disease risk or um, or, herit or variants for these, these biomarker kinds of traits. Um, and then a third important point is that the contributing variants tend to be highly enriched in regulatory regions, indicating that most of the um, heritability is likely flowing through gene regulation. So the, the question that I want to raise to you then is what kinds of models can we think about that, um, that would explain um, the, like the, the mapping from genetic variation in the genome to, to complex traits. So, so how, how should we think about a scenario where we've got perhaps tens of thousands, uh, if not even 100,000 variants across the genome that affect any given trait? Um, and so this is, this is sort of the, the goal now, is to think about models that, that might explain these kinds of data. So, um, so the second half of the talk, I'm going to tell you about the, the model that we've been working on, which we refer to as, uh, as an omnigenic hypothesis. So first of all, um, we, uh, we suggest that um, most of the phenotypic variance is, is driven by regulatory variation in genes that are, are not um, proximately involved in, in the trait in question. Um, secondly, um, we propose that uh, essentially, any gene that's expressed in relevant tissues can have non-zero effects on the trait in question. And so the way that we understand this is as follows. So um, I think of this sort of as a, as a cartoon model for, um, for, for thinking about these questions. So we, we imagine a partitioning of the genes that are expressed in relevant cell types into two classes. First of all are uh, what we refer to as core genes, and these are genes that have direct effects on a phenotype. And then everything else that's expressed in relevant, gene, in relevant tissues uh, we refer to as peripheral genes. And these are genes that, that, math, that can matter um, through effects that are passing through regulatory networks. So if we uh, uh, show a, a causal diagram of this, we imagine that there's, there's some set of core genes. And so from each core gene, there's a, a causal arrow that goes to phenotypes that's not passing through regulation of other genes. And, then, and so when SNPs are in the... When SNPs that are uh, sister core genes are regulating those, then they can have relatively direct effects. And then SNPs that are elsewhere in the genome have to have indirect effects that pass through um, uh, peripheral and, and uh, trans-regulatory effects. And so um, we imagine then that these, these core genes are uh, sitting inside um, gene regulatory networks. And um, 
the, the effects of all of the other genes in the, uh, that are expressed in the relevant cell types are passing through um, weak transregulatory effects onto to core genes to affect the phenotype. Okay, so let's try to be a bit more specific about how this model might work. So first of all, um, we, you know, if, if we imagine a core gene here, and so by definition this would have a, uh, a causal effect on, um, on the phenotype of interest. And now, how does SNP variation play into this? Well, so we could have um, variation in cis that affects regulation of the core gene. So these would be cis EQTLs or cis protein QTLs or, other, or in, in, in any event, uh, like variations affecting um, regulation of this core gene. And then secondly, um, trans effects that are coming from peripheral genes elsewhere in the genome can uh, sort of uh, flow through networks to affect regulation of the core. So the first question to ask then is how much of the gene expression variance should we expect to come from cis versus trans effects? And in principle, this is a, a slightly difficult question to answer because um, it's, uh, so from EQTL mapping studies, it's relatively easy to find cis EQTLs. These tend to have large effect sizes that you can find in modest sample sizes. Um, but trans EQTLs uh, tend to have small effects and they're difficult to detect. Um, however, there's a number of studies that have used different kinds of study designs, for example, looking at heritability and, and pedigrees to, to estimate these effects. And so we, we did a, a literature review to compile these studies. These are using a variety of different <coughs> kinds of um, uh, uh, statistical methods as well as different um, uh, organisms and cell types. And, um, and so these, these studies all suggest that they the bulk of the heritability of gene expression tends to be coming from trans effects. So you can see that the numbers here are ranging across studies from about 60% to about 90% <coughs> of the heritability is being controlled in trans. So just to, to put a number on this for the sake of argument, I'll say that about 70% um, of the heritability is coming from trans effects. So now we can put some numbers on this plot here. So, um, uh, so here we can estimate that for a typical uh, for if, we, if we imagine that core genes are typical of, of genes in general, then we might expect that about, on average, about 30% of the heritability is coming from cis effects and the rest from trans. However, as I mentioned to you before, uh, we do know that trans EQTLs ha must have extremely small effect sizes. So um, here's a, an illustration of this. Um, so uh, so in, this, in this study, um, in this analysis, what we did was to uh, ascertain the, um, the biggest effect size variance uh, for re regulating each gene in, in cis and in trans. And, and when you do this, you get a, a winner's curse effect. So what we did was we, uh, we, took a, we took those through to a replication sample and measured the effect sizes in the replication sample. And so what you can see here is that the, um, the, the cis EQTLs uh, have systematically much, much, much larger effect sizes than, than trans EQTLs. Um, and the y-axis here is measured on, uh, in terms of the, the, z, the z-score, uh, but what's relevant for the variance is actually uh, the square of that, so that, that uh, it exacerbates that difference even more. Okay, so what I've told you so far then is that um, we expect that for a, a typical gene, about 70% of the variance is coming from trans. I've also told you that trans associations tend to be uh, absolutely tiny. And so um, together this implies that a typical gene must really have enormous numbers of weak trans regulators. And, and so then if we assume that a, a typical trait must have, uh, let's say, at least tens of core genes, and each core gene um, perhaps has hundreds of trans-regulatory variants, then this starts to explain how it might be that a large fraction of the genome contributes um, non-zero variants to any given trait. Okay, so that, that's one part of this. A second part is, um, why is it that the core genes don't contribute more of the heritability um, uh, in aggregate compared to the these, these sum of weak trans effects? <laughs> And so to get at this, we need to um, develop a, a simple model. So I'm going to write down basically the simplest kind of phenotypic model that you could um, probably write down for this. So um, we're imagining here that there's a, a quantitative phenotype Y sub I, and we're going to model this simply as a, uh, as a linear model. Uh, so Y bar is going to be the, uh, the average phenotype in the population, and then, the, um, and then we're imagining that the... Um, that we have a, a sum of effects of, of co over core genes. So here, um, 
for, so, so here we're, we're taking a sum over m core genes, and then for each core gene, there's an average expression of the population x bar j, and then xij is going to measure the, the expression of, of that gene in individual i. So here, xij minus xj bar is simply measuring the, the deviation in each individual of that core gene from the average expression. And then gamma j, um, and then so gamma j here is going to measure the, the effect of a unit change of expression of gene j on the phenotype. So, so basically what we, the, the way we think about this then is that uh, there'll be some core genes where if you increase the expression of that core gene, that's going to increase your expected phenotype by, by an amount gamma j, um, and some, conversely for other core genes, maybe decreasing the expression will, um, will increase the, uh, the phenotype value if gamma j is negative. Okay, so now we can compute the, um, uh, the variance of this. So... Um, <clears throat> So now let's see, so, so, so here's this expression. So the phenotypic variance, uh, just using simple mathematical properties, there's going to be two parts to this. So first of all, we've got a, a sum of, um, of the variances of xij times gamma squared. Now I told you before that we should think about these, for these variance terms, we can expect that uh, these will be controlled um, something like a, a third by cis effects on average. Okay, and, um, and about 70% perhaps by, by trans effects. And we've got M of these terms because we're summing these over core genes. And then, of course, we have a series of covariance effects. Um, so, so, this is, so these covariances are going to measure the covariance and expression of every pair of core genes. And the important point here is, first of all, that we should expect these covariance terms to be dominated by trans effects. So if you think about it, um, uh, if you know, most of the time core genes are going to be separated in the genome, and so a SNP that affects <coughs> both of them uh, but has to be acting through trans effects, um, at least in part. And then secondly, the second important point about the covariance terms is that um, there's because there's m choose two of these, there's almost m squared, there's order m squared of these covariance terms. So if, uh, so, so basically, uh, what we need is, is two things for these terms to dominate. So, so if the covariances aren't extremely small, and then secondly, if, if the signs of these gammas tend to line up, then because there are so many of these covariance terms, you can see that these, these can potentially completely dominate the, uh, the phenotypic variance. So to, to show you a simple plot of this, um, uh, what we're showing here is the percent of the heritability that comes from trans effects in this model. So, uh, so the x-axis here shows the number of core genes, and then the different lines correspond to, um, to different uh, parameter values for how important those covariance terms are. And you can see that um, the... Um, so the, the bottom line there is, is where the core genes are completely independent of one another, in which case, the, uh, in which case about 30% uh, of the heritability is coming from cis effects. But if there's even moderate amounts of covariance among <coughs> core genes, then the heritability that's coming through trans effects can get up to be very close to 100%. Um, and, and this really depends completely on the, on the degree of co-regulation of the core genes, as well as whether the, the uh, directions of their effects, these, uh, the product of the gammas, tends to line up on average or not. Um, so, uh, so just to summarize, what I've shown you is that uh, we think that essentially all genes that are expressed in disease-relevant cell types are liable to affect functions of core disease-related genes. Um, secondly, I've shown you that uh, most of the heritability for typical traits um, tends to come from SNPs that lie outside of core pathways. Um, and so we propose that uh, one explanation for this is that probably most of the heritability is actually flowing uh, through very weak trans-EQTL effect from genes that are not directly involved in, in the process that we're looking at. Um, and then the last point that I didn't uh, get to touch on is that um, when we're thinking about organism-level phenotypes like, like height or, or diabetes, uh, many of these or th these kinds of organism-level traits are probably often composed of, of a lot of um, highly polygenic um, endophenotypes. So, so the, uh, you know, the, the urate-level example and the IGF-1 example are um, uh, you know, 
are probably typical examples of, of sort of underlying endophenotypes. Each of those is highly polygenic in its own right. So you can imagine that if you have a more complex trait like, like diabetes that depends on a whole series of different underlying processes, then the the genetics of those more complicated phenotypes is going to be basically a superposition of all of, of, of a whole bunch of, poly, of individual traits that are all already highly polygenic in their own right. Um, we're going to hear next from Guy, who has been working on a, uh, on a related question, um, which is uh, to understand what the role of natural selection is in, 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 um, in these processes. OK, so let me just thank the, the key people who have been involved in, in this. Um, so Evan Yang and, and Chuan Yao, um, as well as NASA. And um, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you.